It became clear that as Iraq took over Kuwait and started to prepare itself in defensive positions, that it set up one of the largest minefields in the history of warfare. The Afghans wanted was something that would take a Soviet tank and like toss it six feet in the air, <coughs> threw everybody up in it. The Italians came out with this mine, very effective. We've got about 100,000 of these. The intent of minefields is to slow and stop the enemy. Our goal was to never stop and never be delayed as we were going through. Any resistance would be met with a ferocious response. As we drove through, we saw the results of that encounter. I was born in 1971. I recall in kindergarten, um, going to school, my teacher asked, what would you like to be when you grow up? And I recall two things. Number one, I'd like to be a soldier. Number two, a firefighter. And so I think that planted a seed in, in my heart and in, and in who I am of maybe at some point serving in the military. When I was a junior in high school, I received a call from a guy that introduced himself as a gunnery sergeant or something and so he started to ask about you know how many pull-ups I could do so I don't know like 11 he said mm, okay how many sit-ups can you do uh, not sure like 30 and um, so he's like okay well that's you know you're the type of guy that we're looking for and so we started to talk more about what the details would be involved in joining the military and I ended up entering the delayed entry program and what the intent was is when you became a senior and graduated, then you would go to boot camp. I remember him bouncing through my front door, all excited, telling me that he was going to be a Marine, that he had actually signed up. And so in those split seconds during that time, I, uh, my heart broke. But at the same time, if I don't let him go, he can never hit the mark that the Lord has for him. And I do have to warn you, this is like it happened today for me as a mother. I've always been a fan of weapons. I've been hunting with my dad since I was about 10. So hunting rifles, pistols. So one thing I like to do is I had a 22 pistol revolver that I would practice twirling. Well, one day on the back deck, I was um, twirling uh, the pistol, my left hand, which was my weaker hand, and the weapon went off. I accidentally uh, shot myself in the leg here. As you notice, this is the, the left side. So this was the entry wound, uh, exit here, very small. Uh, bullet hole. I didn't take much of the energy of the bullet, just went through the muscle. Fortunately, it was no, no permanent damage and it didn't affect um, my, my, uh, my ability to run or, or do anything like that. So I had these two wounds on my thigh, put some band-aids over the top, went to the MEPS uh, physical and passed without an issue. So I turned 18 on the June 3rd. I graduated high school June 6th, and I was into boot camp June 9th. Yes, sir! Get up the bus now! Yes, sir! Get up the bus now! 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 And when I got back, we continued to date. My MOS school was a combat engineer, which is a 1371 is the name of it, the MOS. And the job primarily of a combat engineer is demolitions, mine clearing, and construction.
we learned about all kinds of demolitions, C4, TNT, shape charges, deck cord, all the basics parts of demolition along with the construction. And one of the main components was, was mine clearing as well. There are several techniques that are used for mine clearing. Uh, number one is the pan sweep that you know a lot of people are familiar with. Another way is a technique called a line charge where there's a, a trailer that has like a rocket propelled C4 sock that gets shot out about 100 yards. And then when that lands, they detonate it and it, it explodes a lane that clears the mine, either blows the mines up or out of the way so you can get vehicles and personnel through. Bangalore torpedoes was another option that we used. Typically minefields are surrounded by barbed wire, so you can get up to the wire, take these 10-foot Bangalore torpedoes, and then just start sliding them through 10 feet at a time, linking them together, setting the charge, moving it forward. And then when you blow that, you'll blow a hole in the wire and through the minefield to get you to your next section to move forward. Another strategy that was used is, is heavy equipment. So they had like a bulldozer type um, piece of equipment with a rotating chain up front. And those chains would just churn up the dirt in front of the vehicle. And as it slowly moved forward, the mines would go off. It was a heavily armored piece of equipment, so it could take the, the, the blasts of these mines. One of the main challenges of mine clearing, which is very dangerous, is new technology where the mine detectors aren't able to find them. Uh, they're made of plastic parts, and so the, they're very difficult to, to locate. In addition to that, some of them have delayed uh, explosions, so you could trip it, kind of step by it, and the folks behind you get hit. There's ones that pop up in the air and explode. There's ones that won't get set off by, by foot traffic. It has to get hit by a vehicle, so you could, send, you could walk through, hey, you're good to go, bring that Hummer up, and then, and then it, it detonates that Hummer. So it can be very um, dangerous because it's a, it, it's, it takes you by surprise because you don't know that it's there. The noon deadline passed without the agreement of the government of Iraq to meet demands of United Nations Security Council Resolution 660 as set forth in the specific terms spelled out by the coalition to withdraw unconditionally from Kuwait. To the contrary, what we have seen is a redoubling of Saddam Hussein's efforts to destroy completely Kuwait and its people. I have therefore directed General Norman Schwarzkopf, in conjunction with coalition forces, to use all forces available, including ground forces, to eject the Iraqi army from Kuwait. So I remember distinctly, it was about this time, Susan informed me that she was pregnant. As a young man of 19, I wasn't exactly sure what to do. Um, should we get married? Should I continue to go to college? And around the same time, I received a lit letter from the Marine Corps that said, you need to report to the reserve unit and you're gonna go to San Diego, California, Camp Pendleton for training for eventual deployment into Desert Storm. So at that point, the decision was made on what I was gonna do with Susan that was gonna pause for a while and I was headed to war. So as our plane descended and we were landing in Saudi Arabia, nobody was talking. It was complete silence as the seriousness of what we were about to undertake hit us all. We started taking pills today that will help us in the case we get gassed with chemical weapons. Within a week, I should be in Kuwait in our designated area and the war will be over soon after that, I hope. So our unit's goal was to get to the Kuwait International Airport. And in order for us to, to get there, we had to cross one of the largest minefields ever constructed. So this minefield that separated Saudi Arabia, where we were, to Kuwait, was approximately 30 miles long and about a half a mile wide. As we assembled, um, I saw more 
military equipment that I'd ever seen in my life. Hundreds of Humvees, tanks, troop transports with trailers of supplies, water trucks, fuel trucks. There was just this vast array of, of military might that was laid out in front of me. As we started to move out in the early morning, I believe this was February 19th, in the periphery, we have, we have burning oil wells. We have artillery going off, clearing the way as, as we move forward. It was almost apocalyptic in some ways. The intent of minefields is to slow and stop the enemy. Our goal was to never stop and never be delayed uh, as we were going through. Occasionally we could hear mines going off and as we were going down the road, I saw a vehicle that had got hit by a mine and on top of the vehicle were some of my old friends from the Salem Reserve Unit that I hadn't seen for over a month. I had no idea what what had happened to them, but I saw them on top of that vehicle as we passed by. It's like, hey, Paulison. It's like, hey, how are you guys? We're good. Okay, I'll see you on the other side. So once we got through the minefield, we continued on making the push towards the uh, Kuwait International Airport. And as we were moving, we got hit with artillery. There was a, a truck in front of us that was towing a trailer. It received a direct hit on the trailer, which immediately exploded and the, and the trailer flipped up and over on its back. At that moment, um, our commanding officer came out and he's like, artillery attack, get the 50 cal set up and do not fire until uh, they're within small weapons range. We grabbed the, the entire weapon system and we just started running. We run about 100 yards and we got the tripod set up and we got the ammo in, uh, locked and loaded, and waited at that, at that time. The enemy that we were expecting never showed up. So uh, we were ordered back in the truck and we continued on the route to the Kuwait International Airport. Over the next four days, we basically only stopped for fuel or if there was some type of skirmishes, our main mission was to go to the Kuwait International Airport. And on the fourth day, we reached that goal. We were immediately um, notified that there were enemy troops around the airport with vehicles. We had tanks, we had Humvees with tow missiles on it, and they all opened up. And we just decimated that um, defensive position outside of the airport. And in one of the most incredible firepower displays that I've ever seen, Once we got set up around the airport, it was our job to provide security. There were many abandoned bunkers. There were a lot of abandoned uh, military equipment that needed to be disposed of. So one of the things that, that, that we would do on a daily basis is when these bunkers got identified, our demolition team would go out, we'd go inside. First of all, we'd look for booby traps, make sure that that, that wasn't uh, an issue. And then typically they were full of ammo, weapons. And so we, we typically piled that in the middle of the room, filled and put uh, explosives all around that. And then we uh, ended up demoing the entire bunker. Uh, if we found tanks, we would um, cover them with uh, explosives and blow them in place as well. So they would be unusable to the enemy. So one time we went into this bunker and I was surprised to see a, a bed mattress spring. And I was like, oh, I you know, missed a bunk there, but there was only one. And I noticed that there were anodes coming off of it with like a car battery. And I was like, and the guys with me was like, they're torturing people here. That's what this thing is. It's a metal torturing device that they would tie people down with and electrocute them. 
things like that reminded us of the evil that is in the world, the terrible things that they did to the Kuwaiti people. And we were thankful that we could be a part of the team that was able to, you know, we destroyed that thing, that entire bunker, that entire area. And um, so that was something that uh, we'll never, we'll never forget. If we did run across any, any Iraqi forces, they almost always immediately surrendered. They didn't have very good equipment. Their clothes were, for the most part, tattered. Their weapons were old, and they didn't appear to, you know, be in very well working condition. I don't believe that they had much food. They were always very hungry, very thirsty, and that's one of the first things that we always offered them is, you know, we would share our, our food and our water with them. For the most part, these seem to be civilian young men or, or maybe minimally trained that are in these positions that really didn't want to be there. And then to see us coming, well-fed, well-trained, armed to the teeth, they were ready to be done. And you could see it in their eyes. And so we realized that and did everything that we could to take care of them. Uh, we would pull security at night. We had binoculars and the NVGs where we could uh, observe the perimeter, make sure that there wasn't any enemy movements. When the night work was over, we'd go back during the day and we were off duty during the day. So there wasn't much going on because everyone else was out working. So during this time, I decided that for the first time, I'm gonna read the Bible. So I, st I had the New Testament that my mother had gave me and I started from the beginning and read it through entirely for the first time. And it was a, a unique opportunity because I had the time and the interest and that experience, I believe, fundamentally changed me spiritually. I became, I feel, more spiritually close with God during that time than I had in my entire life. In fact, when I prayed, I asked God that if, if this was a girl that I was to have, then that was a sign that I was going to make it through. And if it was a boy, not because the boy would continue my name. So when I got the letter that said Christy, daughter, had been born, I knew that I was going to be okay and knew that I was going to be reunited with my family again. I found this letter and it's dated um, March 17th and my birthday was March 15th. So my dad still didn't know I was born um, and he wrote this to his grandparents. Dear Grandpa and Grandma, things have been really slow now that the war's over. We really don't do anything all day except odds and ends around camp. I got to talk to my parents on the 15th. It was good to hear their voices. So the day I was born, but he just didn't, they, I wasn't born yet. Um, yesterday we went out looking in Iraq bunkers. They were full of weapons and ammunition. It looked like the guys just got up and ran. Sue is going into the doctors in about five hours to induce labor. I'll be able to call again on Sunday night to hear all about it. Grandma, when you told me you were praying that God would give me a strong love for Sue, he has. I love her more than I thought I ever could love any woman. I plan to get married a few months after my return. Thank you so much for your prayers. While I've been here, God has shown me his will for me in the next few years. And as I continue to seek his face, he will continue to be the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. They say he'll be home by July at the latest, but it could be as soon as April or May. I miss you all so much and can't wait to see you all again. Love, Lance. So this grandma, before she died, um, told me that while she was scared that he was overseas, that she was glad that I was born so she would have a piece of him forever. So it was really special to find this. There are several stops along the way, but we flew into Portland, which was our our final destination. And I'll never forget, I, several of us, including myself, got out and kissed the tarmac. We were so thankful to finally make it back to U.S. soil. 
and how grateful we all were to be Americans seeing what we had seen uh, in the Persian Gulf. I could see family in the distance at the airport and there were balloons and there were um, lots of expectant family waiting for their loved one to get off the plane. So I was one of the uh, first ones to get through and I, I noticed baby Christy. It was about a little over five months since I saw them that last Christmas when I left. And uh, what a reunion it was. And so I, I went and hugged them, saw most all my family and brothers and sisters and mom and dad. And it was shortly after that that uh, Susan and I got engaged. And then in September of 91, we were married. And we were married last year. Susan and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. We were on leave for a few months and then we started into the uh, reserve unit commitment again. And um, that continued on for another four to five years before the end of my contract when I got out in 1996. I joined the military in 2010, so quite a few years after him. I was 19 when I joined. Uh, I tried to join at 17, my mom said no. My dad didn't really talk to me about his military experience. Um, some things, um, a lot of it, I just, you know, I'm his daughter. I think he wanted to shelter me a lot, um, not know the truth of a lot of things. So when I went through, <clears throat> um, he, uh, we had a lot to talk about. When um, he came to see me graduate boot camp, and I think that was like one of his proudest moments. I think I've seen my dad cry four times my entire life. You know, that was one of the times I saw him cry. I just, I knew he was really proud of me. I'll probably remember that moment for the rest of my life. The instilling of the chain of command, the instilling of waking up early, the instilling that you will do whatever it takes to protect your friends and protect your team. Those fundamental tenets of the Marine Corps and military life are still with me today. And that camaraderie was born, developed, and implemented because of the Marine Corps and the military.